Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Dr. Salima, Dr. Stephen for inviting me here. And also thank you for coming over to our madrasa as well. Um, so I've been asked to talk about and share with you our madrasa's experience when engaging with Islam and science. So firstly, by our madrasa, I just want to talk about what that means. So I'm referring to a weekend supplementary school. So when you go to mosques after school, you have children reciting the Quran. But our madrasa functions on the weekend. And we have students from age 4 to 16 and about 350 of them. And we like to believe that our focus is in the transforming of hearts and minds. Um, we are a madrasa which specializes in trying to facilitate the cultural, experiential, conscientious and critical and creative growth of children through to their later teens by means of a holistic pedagogy infused with a synthesizing of traditional and contemporary ideas in order for them to have a well-rounded Islamic world view. Now, in the midst of all of this, we believe that the prophetic tradition is a holistic tradition, with the prophet at the epicenter and in his teachings focused not only on the spiritual and metaphysical, but his teachings also focused on the physical and intellectual pursuits. And in this regard, we like to use a hadith um, in our madrasa uh, from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, focusing on the, the, the need for the physical and also the spiritual together, where he once said, Ta'allamurrumya wal Quran, to learn archery and the Quran. So showing that Prophet Muhammad took an approach that was holistic, it you know catered for the spiritual needs uh, of the Muslims, it catered for their physical needs, metaphysical needs, but also intellectual needs as well. And by our madrasa being in the West, and also being named after Fatima Elizabeth Cates, who was uh, amongst the first female converts to Islam in Victorian Britain, I'd like to quote Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb. He was one of the earliest converts in America during the Victorian period. And whilst lecturing in Madras in December 1892, he gave the reasons for why he believed Islam was the better way. And that's what the lecture was entitled as well, the better way. After giving various reasons, he then moves on to say, uh, I begin quote, because it is the only system that will satisfy the longings of the soul for a higher existence. Because it, is, because it is the only system known to man which is strictly in harmony with reason and science, and because it is free from degrading superstitions and appeals directly to human rationality and intelligence. End quote. Now, what's interesting about Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb is when he accepted Islam, he did it through his own independent research and by the time he accepted Islam, by that point, he had never met an actual Muslim. So all his research was book-based. Uh, and he reached this conclusion, um, you know, during the Victorian era, and then later met Muslims in India. Now, I want to move on to specifically our madrasa and our somewhat journey in relation to science and Islam. And remember, we are just a supplementary school. We're not governed by Ofsted in any way, shape or form. We're independent. We have our own way of thinking. And what happens is we, you know, we, we, we've tried to take on board the prophetic tradition, focusing on the physical. So we have an archery club, cycling club, nationally recognized. We want to focus on the spiritual, of course, and the metaphysical, but also the intellectual. Now, why did we focus on science and Islam? So initially, like I said, you know, we wanted to realize the holistic prophetic tradition and focus our attention on science and Islam. And one of the challenges we felt at the beginning when we wanted our students to be open to science and Islam and the discussions and to answer and to engage with the bigger questions was a lack of academic engagement with science in seminaries, so in Darul Ulooms. So where do we get our teachers from in these madrasas uh, teaching our Muslim children after school? So there was a lack of engagement found there. With the onslaught of scientism, 
So especially through the marketing and equating of evolution to atheism. And, you know, we felt that that was leading a vast array of Muslims to either denounce their faith outright or join an ever-growing number of in-closet ex-Muslims. Now, when I was teaching in secondary school, this is before I opened um, our madrasa, there was a child, there was a student. He was about, I would say about 15, I can't remember exactly. And he was always there for, you know, the dhuhr prayers. He was also given the, one of the mu'avins. He used to lead the prayer, call, you know, do the khutbah for the Friday prayers. One day we came in and, you know, this you know, news spread among students that, oh, he had left Islam. So, you know, when we inquired, we found out he had gone on, you know, he, he had a lot of questions. And then finally, he'd gone on a trip to the Natural History Museum. And ultimately, you know, due to, you know, when it came to the question of evolution, he was unable to get the answers he was looking for. When he took those questions to the mosque, to his madrasa, it was a taboo. They didn't even want to listen to him about it, unfortunately. So that was, you know, a sad story. Now, I've kept that to mind and I wasn't there much longer. But I wanted to ensure that, you know, we have to engage with our, our children, our youngsters on all those questions, because that's the Islamic tradition. We're not shy of any questions. You know, there's various references throughout the Quran about this. So we r realized that when we begin this, that engaging initially may become on a defensive front. It may just be answering questions. When the seeker or collective of seekers engage in an initial clash of ideas and worldviews, which ultimately leads to a deeper rooted understanding of oneself and one's place in the physical world and its echoes in the metaphysical realm. So we felt that this may lead to relearning for some of our students that they're here at the madrasa, they're here at the supplementary school, relearning, redefining and further finding meaning within sacred texts beyond their initial exposure to the tradition that the student may have initially found comfort in. However, the objective is conviction and confidence in one Muslimness and faith tradition. And the ultimate aim is a marriage between the aql and the nakl, um, between the rational and traditional. So, for example, uh, just to quickly reference some of the lectures that we had amongst our students where we invited Dr. Shwe whenever he was here in London. He spoke of the scientific miracles in the Quran, looking at them critically um, and looking at scientific miracles previously, what Muslims uh, initially engaged with, but now looking at them critically. Because what we didn't want was for them to learn about scientific miracles, for instance, then go into university, and then again, when they're in university, they understand the academic understanding of it, and then again, there's that sense of confusion. We had uh, many scientists come to our students and openly speak to them about Islam, science, and philosophy. Open Q&A, they could ask anything they like. That was the ad hoc initial um, exposure they had or our madrasa had to science and Islam. So hence for us, the student therefore excels initially as soon as he engages with the, you know, within our curriculum of Islam and science, they excel, he excels in understanding and tafakkur was, you know, focusing um, on the physical. So they do tafakkur on the physical realm through the pursuit of science. So we explain that the realm around us, the physical realm, the pursuit for that is in science and the metaphysics and spirituality is through Islam. The argument from contingency, for instance, to prove the existence of God, is no longer than merely an academic pursuit for them, but transcends philosophy into a journey of realization of God in this humble madrasa and conscientious conscientiousness of their contingency. The student at our madrasa thus treads the path uh, in life constantly in awe of Allah as well. So touchy kumbon the spiritual side. So where did our engagement with science and Islam begin? So myself, I'm not a specialist in science at all, far from it. I went to a conference in Cambridge University and that's where I first came and met Dr. Shoaib. And he was lecturing on atheism and Islam and I felt that this is something that all the madrasas of the UK and beyond can you know, really take from to understand where there's misinformation and to understand what is the actual case when it comes to uh, new atheism, etc. Um, before we could do anything further with Dr. Shwe, uh, we have uh, one of our parents who's also a scientist, uh, uh, she uh, Sheikh uh, Uthman Ali. So he did the very first lecture both for parents and then later on for students as well on the critique of the major themes of Darwinian evolution, 
Following that, so this is our ad hoc period initially of engaging with science and Islam and opening up the discussion of Islam and science. Then we looked at, in November 2018, atheism, science and Islam, so focusing on neo-atheism. And then finally, uh, it came to January 2019, just before COVID, we looked at evolution, science and Islam. Again, Doctor, that's when Dr. Shoaib uh, briefly spoke about science and Islam. We later had a conference which was about five hours long. It's available on YouTube as well, where we delved deeper on evolution. We had about five lecturers for that. Now, if you go back 20 years, I don't think uh, it would have been possible or it wouldn't have been heard of doing such a lecture on evolution, opening up everything that's out there, what evolution means scientifically, and how do we engage theologically. So students had these ad hoc sessions with academics, mainly including Dr. Schweb and also Sheikh Uthman Ali. Now what we've started doing is where we, when it comes to philosophy of science and religion, we have partnered with Basira Institute, who have come up quite a few times on some of the slides. So they're one of the, you know, I would say only institutes that have a textbook on engaging science in Islam for teenagers okay, or college students. So we are currently using their textbook, Why Islam is True. And in this textbook, so that's the first uh, textbook, textbook one for year one, they focus on philosophy and science. So it covers the contingency argument, covers uh, you know scientific topics like evolution, etc. The second year focuses on the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it focuses on Risala. And the third year is on the Medinan period, which focuses on politics and economics. So again, that fitted nicely into our curriculum of a holistic pedagogy for our Muslim children. Um, now, what were the results of this engagement with wider community? We did this with parents, locally, but also online as well. So we had a presence online, especially with Dr. Shuwaib. So this, as I mentioned before, led to the Islam um, and Evolution Conference, which was five hours long. Many people came from throughout the country. But also, one thing that we wanted to ensure was we didn't want to try and give all the answers, but rather was just to open the discussion amongst these students, lay flat everything that's out there, and then it's for them to continue that journey. So just to give you one example, when it came to the topic of evolution and we delved deeper, Dr. Shuaib interviewed three um, academics. Um, and the reason for that was to look at evolution in all its you know, diversity. So initially, one of them, on one side of the scale, he looked at Islamic contentions with evolution with Dr. Shadi al-Masri. Okay? And on the other uh, strand, he spoke to, reconciling Islam, uh, spoke to Dr. Rana Dajani about reconciling Islam and evolution. And then somewhat in the middle, we have Dr. Solomon Jalajil on tawakkuf and human evolution. So that's the framework we were trying to give to our students to open up this discussion. And these, um, you know, um, interviews were happening during lockdown, where we had many students who were not at school, and they were kind of plugging into these discussions as well. And ultimately, Dr. Shweb wrote his book on evolution and Islam from the Ghazalian perspective. Um, so now we've gone from ad hoc to having weekly lessons on science, uh, philosophy and Islam using the Al-Basira textbooks, for instance. Now, what, what have we achieved? So there's one example I wanted to, to, to mention. We have a student, very, very bright, academically, but also Islamically. She, you know, as I say, she knows her stuff. But it was just uh, last year when we started this course, it had only been about six, five to six months. She actually came to class one day and she mentioned to her teacher that she's used uh, a couple of chapters from the book uh, to do a project at school for her year 11 project and she wanted to share it with the class so she shared it with the class so she got that confidence uh, in terms of her faith and Muslimness but also being able to talk about science as well and she mentioned how by January of last year she had considered herself an atheist or an in-closet ex-Muslim she had left us her parents didn't know about this but then, and, and, you know, one of the reasons was, you know, topics like evolution, but also just friendships. And we're talking about teenagers here. And what this course did for her, and this is something that we wanted to provide the students is, not with the answers, but with somewhat of the tools to find their own answers. And that's what she said, that when she did uh, aspects of science, uh, philosophy and Islam, she was able to get the tools and then be able to speak to her, uh, you know, friends and gain more confidence in, t in expressing herself 
when it came to science and Islam. And that's what we wanted to give our students, not the answers, but maybe the tools, the road path to find their own answers and go on their own journey. There were a few more points I wanted to mention, but I will, um, you know, finish here. Um, so what, one, one more thing we did, actually, we had a, we tried to find as many role models who were already in the fields of science. So, for example, and then not just having them, you know, lecture all the time, but have them on grassroots level with the students very in various activities. So being a weekend madrasa, we actually invited an astrophysicist. Uh, she works for NASA. She does research for NASA. She's very young. And she joined us in camping for three days, for instance. And you can imagine the, you know, the, 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 the level of discussion amongst the boys and girls uh, at the camp. And when she spoke about the stars, the names, and spoke about them, that really boosted the confidence level of our children who were going to this you know, small, humble madrasa on the weekend. And lastly, I'll just summarize what I was going to say. Um, engaging with science and Islam, and a lot of these uh, scientists as well, when it came to the COVID-19 lockdown, I uh, just want to summarize that we were able to put together a document, present it to our parents, and that in itself, so it's, you know, trying to marry science and Islam, we were able to come up with our policy using both the prophetic tradition and science as well, where we looked at the hadith, okay, what does the hadith say about pandemics and epidemics, and how the, the, you know, the prophetic tradition engaged with them, okay, not to leave a town, etc. And then we looked at the scientific data that was available, and this was about two to three weeks before the country went into lockdown and before the schools closed down. So we were not waiting for the government's advice on this. We felt that we were confident enough to engage with the prophetic tradition and science to therefore come up with our policy. And we were able to, two weeks before the country went into lockdown, explain to parents through the prophetic tradition and scientific data that was available at the time um, to, to go into lockdown, you know, a couple of weeks before uh, the country itself did. And then we also sent that out to parents with a form saying, do you agree or disagree? And we had like an overwhelming response with about 89% who agreed with our method in engaging with science and Islam as well. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, hopefully if you have any questions, we'll have them later on.